relational learning angle. Uh, so then uh, Guy would uh, probably, you know, have just been teaching a class about this for a while, I suppose. Um, so today I'd like to tell you a, a slightly different tech uh, on, on this uh, topic, where, you know, how one world could benefit from the other uh, with the right setup. Okay. Um, so let's uh, go back uh, to history a little bit. Uh, just a couple of years after it was born, there was a great debate um, uh, regarding navigational versus relational databases. And um, uh, probably Carlo or um, uh, w would be able to tell you a lot more about this, this debate than I do. Um, and uh, effectively, it was between declarative programming and, and imperative programming in the database uh, model in, in some sense. Uh, so there, you know, these are the two representatives. Uh, I hope you know who uh, Ted Cott uh, is. Uh, but uh, Charles uh, Beckman at the time was a Turing Award winner. So uh, and at the time, Ted wasn't you know, as well known. Um, and uh, you can go back uh, on Wikipedia and read about this, this debate. Uh, it's fascinating because you can see the man manifestation of the same debate going on right now uh, with, you know, graph databases and, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, the NoSQL and, and so on. Okay? Uh, so it's really story and history repeats itself, right? However, one thing that is not debatable is uh, who won the debate you know, between relational and, and navigational. Um, so one way to make the winning argument uh, is for your stock price to grow like 90,000% uh, over the years, right? So that's, this is certainly not debatable. It's kind of interesting also to um, look at the dot-com uh, crash. Um, and, you know, at some point you would kind of worry that that thing is going to hit again. Uh, but that's a different story. Okay? Um, the other uh, kind of uh, data item I'd like to point out is that uh, around that time there was a company called Ingress, um, whose CEO was uh, Gary Morgan Thaler. Uh, he is now our chairman at Relational AI. Um, it was uh, kind of sold a little bit uh, too early, uh, I think, uh, but it was a really, really good company. And uh, one of the names you might recognize uh, is uh, the second name from the bottom. Uh, Michael Stonebreaker. So, uh, yeah, he's you know he received the Turing Award uh, a few years ago. Right? So um, the other item I, I also want to point out is that you know um, Oracle was formerly called Relational Software Inc. Right? It wasn't called Oracle, and then Ingress was uh, uh, Relational Technology. Right? Uh, so you know Relational AI has certain roots. Okay, uh, it's also not debatable that, that relational databases are extremely popular, right? Uh, and you can look at, um, you know, uh, the uh, technologies that are very popular right now, uh, um, looking at certain, certain ranking. Um, uh, basically, the relational data model dominates the data management. Uh, in the last 40 years, uh, there's a massive adoption of relational data model. We were talking to some potential customers a few uh, weeks ago, and... Uh, uh, they had something like 20, um, 23,000 different re relational databases. Uh, yeah, so it's basically it's everywhere. Okay? And there were millions of human hours invested in building relational uh, data models and populating them with, uh, with data. Right? Relational databases are, are really rich with knowledge of the underlying domain because uh, you actually have to encode domain knowledge uh, using relationships uh, in the data uh, with functional dependencies, with uh, integrity constraints, and so on. So there's a lot of man hours, you know, over the past 40 years, uh, building up uh, these uh, data models and, and storing them. You know, there's indexing technology, uh, and so on. Okay? Uh, in fact, if you look at uh, surveys from Kaggle, uh, which is kind of a popular website uh, for, uh, um, you know, data science competition, right? Um, then it turns out that the majority of the data that uh, they have to deal with are relational data. They are not text, they are not image, they are not uh, you know, video data, they are relational data. That's very real problems, right? Um, in particular, if you even narrow it down further to uh, retail sector or insurance or marketing or financial, you will see that you know, overwhelming majority are relational data. Um, 
So then, you know, given this, this long history uh, with a lot of human hours involved in building up these uh, technology and, and uh, uh, databases, what do we do when we first, uh, what, what do we do first when, when we build a machine learning, learning model on top of the relational data? So uh, here's one example of a, a schema that you might see in practice, right? So there could be like uh, hundreds of tables, each of them with different attributes, uh, encoding domain knowledge about uh, this, this domain. Uh, the first thing we would do is we issue a query into the database um, and extract it out, um, essentially to, you know, to get the trending samples, right, along with some features uh, out of the database. So the effect is that we throw away all of the relational structures that we worked so hard to build uh, over the years. Uh, and in effect, we throw away also years of business knowledge um, to think uh, about it. And the other thing I want to make, uh, uh, it may not be obvious, is that um, working on data um, in this form actually is not very natural um, unless you are very, very well trained in machine learning and you have made this IRD assumption and every row seems to be you know, drawn independently from a common distribution, which is kind of a questionable assumption anyhow, right? So it is not natural, both in terms of uh, computational efficiency, in terms of uh, the wastefulness um, uh, of, you know, the human knowledge of, that was invested into building these models. Okay? Um, uh, and uh, the, the story does not end there, right? So after we do, um, what do we do with the result of the query? Uh, a lot of variables are categorical variables, like color or uh, week or month. Then we have to one hot encode it uh, to turn it into numeric format. Uh, uh, and then you would feed it into a machine learning tool, like scikit-learn or you know, TensorFlow and, and things like that. Okay. Um, so um, it seems there's something that's obviously going wrong here, right? Um, uh, so let's try to revisit this problem from uh, first principles. Okay. What if, um, so uh, this is kind of the first part, which is the majority part of, of the talk, uh, is uh, remember there were two worlds, right? the statistical and the relational. And uh, the first part of the talk will be about uh, how the statistical uh, world uh, could benefit from the uh, relational world. And then the second part of the talk is the, the other way around, which I will not spend much time on at all, because that deserves uh, uh, its own attention. Uh, but I will mention a few uh, slides about uh, that. So this is basically the bulk of the talk is on, on this topic. Okay. All right, so um, what if we can move the machine learning uh, closer to where the data is, you know, without undoing all of these years of knowledge and you know, uh, um, issuing the, the uh, feature extraction query and you have to materialize this output Typically, in practice, uh, you would see a uh, CSV file, humongous. Okay? Um, and at Logic Blocks, uh, we had uh, quite a few data scientists doing these things. Uh, so not only that I you know, invented uh, the uh, data science workflow, uh, we actually lived by this, and we, uh, Logic Blocks was uh, acquired. Um, so in effect, we also made some money out of you know, doing that, that uh, main loop. Okay? Uh, but also uh, that kind of painful experience uh, informs us of uh, perhaps it's better to move the machine learning closer to where the data is. Okay? So in particular, we, we can avoid um, materializing the join itself. This is a, a really big cost. I'll show you some numbers later. If you have to compute a join, uh, it takes a very long time, uh, and it in interferes with, with the data science uh, task. Uh, avoid the one hot encoding, uh, which is uh, basically making out, you know, um, uh, a, a, a color would become an indicator vector of you know, one, one, and a bunch of zeros, right? So that's a big waste in both in terms of time and space. Um, and we would like to exploit, exploit the relational structures uh, to speed up the learning, the training of the model. Okay? And in, in some cases, ideally, we would like to train models faster than the time it takes to actually compute a join query in the first place. Okay? And uh, this is th both theoretically and practically possible to do. Not for all models, but for, um, we are working on uh, you know, extending the class of models that we can support. Okay? Um, and that would be kind of the ideal scenario, right? Because we don't really want to compute a join. Uh, join is something very complicated. I have uh, thought about joins in the past like seven uh, years or so. 
Um, so I know a little bit about, uh, you know, if, if anything, machine learning is not really my main uh, uh, kind of uh, couple, uh, or uh, the thing that I'm, I'm not, I'm most um, comfortable with, but join is something I, I can certainly talk to you like days in and out about. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, I discussed relational uh, structures. Uh, what do I mean by that? So I'm gonna, going to give you three examples of relational structures uh, that we can exploit to speed up machine learning. Uh, the topology of the joint query itself. Um, okay. uh, the fact that in many domains, there are a lot of categorical variables. So in fact, one of the very first things that a data scientist uh, told me when I uh, started working with them at LogicBlox was that 99% of our variables are categorical. The, the, a couple of things that are not categorical are things like uh, sales and uh, age and uh, maybe inventory. Right? The rest of them, like uh, you know, color and uh, date and uh, store and zip code, and you know, all of those things are categorical variables. And this has a, a huge effect on, on the runtime and, and also the kind of model you would like to, um, uh, to, to experiment with. And then uh, in a database, you will see a lot of functional dependencies. Okay? Uh, there's, there's some kind of mathematical dependencies between variables, uh, and we would like to translate that into machine learning uh, or speeding up machine learning models. Okay? So um, in the uh, day and age of deep learning, uh, let's go back to basic and talk about uh, uh, you know, the workhorse of, of, uh, of data analytic, you know, linear regression. Uh, because we would like to re-examine uh, this workflow from the beginning, so why don't we go with the simplest possible model? And uh, you know, in the context of a, a short talk, uh, this is something that is easy to convey, uh, but do not underestimate uh, the poor old linear regression. Uh, it is still making a lot of money. Um, okay? uh, if you choose the right features, uh, sometimes linear regression is, is all you need. All right, so uh, what, what is this model? Uh, so I, I do not assume that all of you know uh, machine learning, so I'll go through it quickly. This will be like the first slide of uh, you know, any machine learning course, right? So it goes something like this. Um, we would like to, um, so from, from the data, uh, we have uh, uh, you know, so billions or millions of rows, right? And on every row you have a, a tuple x, a vector x, uh, and you would like to use that to predict the response variable y. Okay? And the simplest model to do this prediction is a linear model. So you would take a, uh, a dot product of x and a parameter vector uh, beta and use that as uh, the prediction. Okay? Uh, now, obviously, you cannot hit y every time, right? So you would like to measure the error, the difference between your prediction and y itself. And uh, the error is measured with some sort of loss function. Uh, in this case, we're going to use uh, square loss. Uh, and so um, it's basically the difference between x times beta minus y square. Uh, and then you would have to sum it over all of your data points right? uh, and, uh, and try to find the beta that will minimize uh, this, this sum. Okay? And then the second term, the lambda over 2 times beta square, is called the uh, penalty or regularizer. Uh, that is to control the um, overfitting, control the complexity of your model. If you change the loss function a little bit, uh, you will uh, basically capture a lot of machine learning models. Okay? So the simplest one would be uh, squared loss. All right. Um, so then uh, if you think of the, the, the x side as a big matrix x and the y side as a huge uh, vector y, then um, uh, we can also rewrite this in, uh, in matrix form. Okay? So that is just be x times beta minus y squared. Um, a big matrix times a vector minus y square, and then a norm of beta square. Right? So after some rearrangement, uh, it will come down to something like this. Right? Uh, it's a quadratic form. It's a quadratic function in beta. And uh, uh, we would like to minimize that. Right? So if you notice that this term, um, one half of a sum over y square, is independent of beta, which is the thing we are trying to optimize for. So you can drop that from the minimization problem. So the problem becomes just minimizing this function j of beta. Uh, you can drop the constant uh, term that's independent of beta. Okay. So here's the first observation, uh, which is also not our observation. It should be in some machine learning textbooks uh, already. Right. Is that if you, um, uh, so this is a matrix. Uh, let's call it um, sigma. 
uh, it's sort of like the covariance matrix uh, without the uh, uh, shifting of the data to the sen center point. Right? Uh, and then there's um, this, this vector uh, effectively measuring um, uh, covariance uh, sort of uh, between the response and, and the data. All right, uh, so in a very short form, uh, the, the function that we would like to minimize uh, is a, of quadratic form. It goes like this, you know, beta transpose times sigma times beta minus c times beta uh, plus the norm beta square. So that's the problem. Okay. Right, so, so far it's, you know, machine learning 101. There's nothing uh, interesting going on. Now, in order to solve this problem, um, uh, there are two ways. So if you take the derivative of this, the gradient, uh, uh, it is also a quantity that is dependent on sigma and, and, and c. So there are only two quantities, right? The matrix sigma and the vector c. Um, so if, um, if you set the gradient to be 0, uh, then you can actually solve for the optimal solution. There's nothing surprising uh, here, right? Um, and uh, the optimal solution has actually even a closed form. So it's just uh, sigma plus lambda i, i is the identity matrix inverse times c. Now, of course, in practice, you don't com want to compute the inverse of a matrix because that's numerically unstable. Uh, so you would compute something like a Kolesky decomposition of the matrix uh, and then use it to, to actually compute the inverse times of vector c. Okay? But that's only for small n and uh, you know, for, for big data, whatever that means, uh, for um, n bigger. Then you would run an optimization algorithm uh, to solve the optimization problem without actually computing the, uh, the, the inverse or the Kolesky decomposition of the matrix. Because Kolesky decomposition scales like uh, n cube. Uh, and uh, if you use something like gradient descent, every time you, you compute the gradient, uh, whose formula I get there, uh, it takes only about n square or so to compute. And the number of iterations is, is a few hundred iterations. And if n is more, like, uh, more than a few hundred, then you will start to see the effect of uh, gradient uh, descent um, in the sense that it's going to be faster than uh, computing the Kolesky decomposition. Okay. But uh, my, my main message here is that um, even though the problem we started with was you know, on a huge uh, data set, right, um, what we really need is only this little quantity, uh, the, the matrix sigma, and the vector c. Um, so, uh, in particular, you know, sigma is actually uh, uh, x transpose x. Uh, so, in, uh, x is supposedly is a very, very tall matrix. It has millions and millions of rows. But then the number of columns uh, is a lot less. Okay? It could be like in the tens or in the hundreds. Okay? Um, and so, this, this quantity is like a digest that you compute from the data. And if there was a way to compute this quantity without computing x, then we win. So this is the, really is the, the key message that uh, if you can imagine a way somehow to compute sigma without computing x, uh, even though x was defined to be, uh, um, I mean sigma was defined to be x transpose x, uh, there is actually a way to do that. Okay? Uh, similarly, for similarly for c, right? Uh, we we don't necessarily have to uh, materialize x and then multiply with y to get c. If there was a way to get around that, that problem. Uh, then you would speed things up considerably. Okay? So that kind of is the vision, right? So instead of you know, doing this machine learning outside, if you um, uh, kind of dig under the hood a little bit, and you know maybe in machine learning all we need is that sigma and the c, then you can move that computation inside a database, right? So now you can sort of buy the idea that there's no need for this material materialization if there was a way to compute sigma and c. All right. Um, OK, now, um, so how do we compute uh, um, you know, uh, sigma and c? We would interpret these quantities, uh, the relational semantic of these quantities. Okay. This is very important. So if you go back to the definition, um, you will see the following uh, pattern. So sigma is a matrix, right? Uh, and uh, in fact, you know, given uh, given i and j, you would have an entry sigma ij, something like that. Okay? Uh, if you stare at this formula for a moment, you will re realize the following uh, um, idea: that if both i and j are numeric variables, numeric attributes like age and price, for example, okay? 
then this entry sigma ij uh, from that mathematical formula uh, can be uh, formulated as basically uh, an aggregation query. It is aggregating over um, the, the body of the, of the joint query. And then you have to sum over the product of xi times xj. Okay. This is completely something that the database uh, should be able to do very well. Okay. Um, and of course, we are going to replace that, uh, that design matrix with whatever the query, exp uh, uh, the feature extraction query that we started with. We, we wouldn't want to materialize the design matrix. So you have to replace that D with the, the actual query and not, uh, not the, re the result of the query. Okay. Um, now, so here's the effect of categorical variables. So when i is a categorical variable, like color, right? Uh, so then sigma ij is no longer a, a scalar. Uh, it is going to be a vector. There's one value for, for every color. Okay? So it'll become a vector. And uh, um, the, the, the entry is a group by uh, query, uh, aggregate query, uh, group by color, for instance. And then if both of the variables are categorical variables, uh, then sigma ij is a matrix, it's a little matrix. But the matrix is very sparse. So um, uh, in order to compute this matrix, all you have to do is, is compute an aggregate query, uh, is a count query uh, grouped by xi and xj. So uh, for instance, you, for every color and every city, uh, you would like to count the number of output tuples uh, which occur with that combination of color and city. So um, uh, basically, um, in the relational world, uh, the quantities that you need for machine learning are a collection of relations. Okay. And each of those relations is really uh, an aggregation, the head of an aggregation query. So we have turned the, you know, this, this matrix computation problem into completely relational uh, algebra, if you will, uh, and, uh, and that's it. Uh, so, so then, you know, so the, the first lesson from this uh, observation is that it's really aggregate queries on the way down. Okay? So from here, we don't materialize the output. What we do is we issue something like O of n square many aggregation queries to form uh, this matrix. This matrix is a matrix of relations. Uh, and they are really sparse representation of the matrix. Um, and O of n aggregation queries to, for the vector C. Right? Okay, so uh, here's one example. So you, if you take this idea and apply it on, say, um, a data set from Kaggle competition, okay? So uh, the schema here is, is like way simpler than the, the schema that you would probably see in a, a real setting, right? So the schema has only uh, like five tables uh, with, uh, with stores and uh, demographies and items and inventory and so on. Okay? And uh, we would then want to join them together to form the design matrix, right? So if you apply this idea, uh, what you will see is the following. The, the input uh, size is about 2.1 gigabytes, okay? uh, If you add up all of the tables together, okay? Now, um, if you were to join them, if you were actually to join them using, say, Postgres SQL, okay? Uh, you would have uh, um, um, the, the design matrix size uh, of about 23 gigabytes, okay, which is certainly about uh, in, uh, 10 times or, or so bigger than, or 11 times bigger than input size, right? Um, the time it takes in Postgres SQL to compute the join is about 217 seconds alone. Okay? So just the time it takes to, to, to take the data out of the database, right? Uh, um, and then you would have to actually, sorry, so, uh, Time to export uh, is, is even more than that, right? So you, you bring the data out from the database, it's like 400 seconds or so, and then uh, you, uh, you, you know, feed it into TensorFlow and it will train this model in time, something like 12,000 uh, seconds, okay? Uh, all right, if, uh, if you do what I just kind of hinted at uh, doing, um, then the, the original size is like 2.1 gigabyte and you leave the data in the database, right? And then it takes about 18 seconds or so to compute the, the green thing, the sigma matrix and the, the, the little C vector. It takes about 18 seconds. And after that, because we have already uh, computed sigma and C, we can use the formulas that you see before 
uh, to train this model in half, less than half a second. Okay. So uh, uh, basically, we can be about you know 670 times faster and 11 times smaller. Okay. Now you can also you know once you have realized this matrix, you can train models on subset of variables. So uh, in effect, doing something like an L1 regularization uh, by by selecting subsets of variables to train your model on, and then every model after this. Uh, it is still half a second because you have already computed that matrix. You can take just a submatrix out without, you know, uh, touching the original data again, right? Uh, so if you compare that that half a second with the time it takes, uh, like TensorFlow to train this model, it's about twenty-four thousand times faster. Okay. All right. So um, I, I hope that I have given you kind of a, a, a hint of how the effect of categorical variable in uh, in speeding up uh, uh, machine learning training uh, in, in a database. So the next thing I, I'd like to give a hint of is uh, the idea of using functional dependencies. Remember, we would like to exploit relational structures to speed up algorithms, right? So functional dependency is uh, extremely common uh, in databases. And the motivation for this is the following. So we still want to compute something like O of n square, uh, n square many, aggregation queries, right? Now, in a typical retail application, which uh, uh, we dealt uh, with a lot, um, uh, and is something like in the order of 25, okay? Now, 25 squares, 625 is not a small number. So if you have to compute 625 aggregates, or it's roughly half of that because this matrix is symmetric, uh, but still, it's you know 300 something uh, many uh, group by queries is is a big number. Okay? So if there is any way to reduce this, that's, that'd be great. Right? Um, and that's the motivation of using functional dependencies. Okay. okay. Uh, so functional dependencies are everywhere. So in for instance, if you take a, a retailer schema, then the the schema of the database is typically uh, snowflakey. And by that I mean uh, you would have things like a date, right? And from a date, uh, you know the uh, day of week. Uh, you know whether or not it is weekend. Uh, you know the month. You know the year. Uh, you would know the week of year, right? Uh, the w which you know of the 52 weeks of year it is. Um, if you know the store in which an item was sold, uh, then you would know the zip code. You know the city, the state, the country, and so on. And, and each of them uh, also has other attributes uh, going out. So this is how you would grow into this gigantic uh, schema uh, information that you saw earlier. Okay? And it, it typically grows something like that. Right? Or uh, an item uh, uh, has a color, it has a brand, it has uh, you know, the class, the class has, uh, subclass has a class and a department that it belongs to. Uh, so then from about three attributes or so, the date, the store, and the item, uh, you get the remaining variables of almost for free okay, because of the functional dependencies. It, this is very uh, typical of a retail uh, application schema. Okay. Now, th that's how we got the 25 variables, right? Because the 25 variables uh, or attributes come from these guys. Uh, if there was a way to kind of collapse them, because there's obviously some re dependency going on, right? then that'd be, uh, that'd be great. So let's look at uh, one example. Uh, let's say we have this function and dependency city to country, right? Um, and let's assume that in the database we have uh, only two countries, Vietnam and England, and uh, city uh, are uh, Saigon, Hanoi, uh, Oxford, Leeds, and Bristol. Okay? So let's say those are the active uh, values in, uh, you know, those are the active domains of uh, country and city. So um, the effect of one-hot encoding is something like this. So when you issue the, the feature extraction query, you would have a variable called uh, x country. Right? But x country is not numeric, so you have to one-hot encode it. What that means is that the x country is turned into uh, a vector, a tuple of variables. So there's one value for Vietnam and there's one for England. And if the, the, the output tuple uh, actually belongs to Vietnam. If the transaction actually occurred in Vietnam, then the ex-Vietnam bit is going to be turned into one, and the England bit will be turned to zero. Okay? And similarly for uh, for cities, right? So basically, every output tuple 
has only one CT bit turned on, uh, depending on which CT that is. Right? The other uh, bits are zero. Okay? That's one hot encoding. Now, uh, I would like to convince you of this extremely simple identity okay, that will occur in every output tuple if you were to one hot encode it, uh, which is that um, X Vietnam is always equal to X Saigon plus X Hanoi, assuming those are the only cities occurring in the database. Okay? And that's because if this tuple uh, is an England tuple, right, then X Vietnam will be zero, and obviously X Saigon and X Hanoi would both be zero. If this tuple was uh, a Vietnam tuple, then only one of the cities uh, occurs in the transaction. Uh, let's actually, uh, uh, let me rephrase that. Um, so the, the, the tuple would have to be kind of indexed by the cities and not by the country. So um, if this tuple was, was either Saigon or Hanoi, uh, then uh, the country would have to be Vietnam. If this tuple was one of the England cities, uh, then this bit would be turned on. That makes sense? Okay. So that, that's how you, you would get this kind of uh, identity um, out from the functional dependency uh, um, uh, from the data. Okay. Um, so this turns out to have kind of an interesting effect uh, uh, overall. And it goes like this. Okay, so you, you can try to exploit this relationship and do dimensionality reduction uh, on the data. So first of all, um, there has to be a, a relation or a predicate in the database uh, which would encode this city to country uh, uh, functional dependency. Right? You, you, when you denormalize the database, uh, you would have a relation on, on city and country. And if you would like to know which country a city belongs to, then you would have to look up for the key, which is the city, and then you, uh, you extract out the, the country. Uh, okay? uh, but at, a, at an abstract level, the relation city-country can also be viewed as uh, a, the sparse encoding of a matrix. Okay? A matrix would have uh, two rows, the Vietnam and England rows, and the cities are uh, Saigon, Hanoi, uh, Oxford, Leeds, and Bristol. Okay? Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, on Vietnam, so if you look up, uh, if you give me a column, I can tell you which row it has a one on. Okay? That's basically is the encoding of the, uh, of the relation. Okay? So uh, keep that relation in mind. We implicitly, the relation encodes this matrix. Okay? So now, the functional dependency, as I hopefully have convinced you just now, uh, encodes uh, that sort of linear equation, right? linear relationship. Okay? So then, if you put R, or whatever R, uh, the matrix that R encodes, uh, into, uh, so you put the, the X, uh, X city uh, components into a vector, uh, and X country component also into a vector, then uh, the relationship is, is actually a, a linear relationship. Okay? So X country is exactly R times X city as a matrix. We, we don't do this. I'm just trying to express the mathematical relationship. Okay? Um, so in particular, so uh, we, we just take that matrix that we saw up there. Right? This is an indicator vector for the city of, uh, I guess in this case, would be Hanoi, right? So if you give me the, uh, the indicator vector for the, uh, for the city of Hanoi, and you multiply it with that matrix, you would end up with the indicator vector for the country of Vietnam. That's how the relationship uh, is, right? This is actually uh, something that if we were to export the data and one hot encode it and feed it into some machine learning tool, if it's any good, it will have to re kind of recall, rediscover this relationship, right? Because once you have flattened out the data, there was no way to tell. There's not even a semantic of every column anymore, right? It, it's, it's just uh, zero, one variables everywhere. And, uh, there's no semantic to, to the column, let alone the linear relationship that you, you can kind of read off from the database. Okay? So how does this affect uh, the model? Well, uh, it affects in, 
here's one way that you can use this idea to re-parameterize the model. Uh, remember the, the relationship we had was x country is equal to r times xcd. So uh, the model was a dot product of, of uh, beta and x, right? Um, so uh, then you can take it to be the sum of the dot products over all of the attributes uh, from uh, uh, the model, uh, in which uh, you have a dot product between you know beta ct and x ct. Every city, every city has a coefficient uh, beta ct, x ct, beta country, next country, and so on. So we are going to plug in that formula, uh, x country is equal to r times x city. So we get r times x city on that side. Right? And then uh, when you take the dot product, you can take the transpose of the matrix and put, in, put it on the other side of the dot product, of the inner product. Okay? Uh, so this is just algebraic manipulation. But now you see that x country is gone, uh, is no longer there. We don't need the country variable anymore. So after regrouping, uh, we just have a dot product of this quantity with x city. So the, the idea is that why don't we reparameterize the model and call this new quantity gamma. So now uh, everything is still the same as before, except that uh, anything to do with country is gone, uh, and we have a new coefficient gamma, uh, gamma city. And, and that's it. So then, if you have, keep applying this trick, everything that was functionally determined is is gone, right? So the, the sigma matrix, which was out of n square before, uh, is now probably like three square instead of n square because you have store uh, and date and uh, uh, an item. Uh, those functionally determine everything else, right? And everything else, if you apply it, this exact same trick, uh, would would go away. Uh, so that saves a lot of time in, in computation, but something has got to give. Right? So what did we lose when we apply this trick? Well, you also have to look into the penalty term, the regular riser, uh, what happens there. Right? So uh, we did a change of variable, effectively, uh, and the fancy word for change of variable is reparameterization. Right? So uh, gamma city is equal to beta city plus uh, RT times beta country. So you look at the penalty term, and uh, you know it used to have a beta city before, right? uh, and also beta country. And if you uh, plug in that formula, right? um, so then uh, that would become you know gamma city minus. So it's basically replacing the purple quantity by the equivalent quantity below. Uh, but now notice the following: that if you take the partial derivative of this quantity with respect to uh, to the vector uh, beta country and set it to zero because you know at optimality this has to be zero, then you can actually solve for beta country uh, in terms of gamma city. Okay? And uh, and in fact, so this this seems to be like an, a matrix inverse operation, but it turns out that it, um, that it is just a low rank update to uh, an identity matrix. Um, which you apply the uh, uh, Woodbury identity, then a return again into an aggregation query. So I, I want to convince you that everything in the entire, uh, you know, um, uh, a cycle of, of things we have done so far is turned into a relational database query, and even matrix inverse right? uh, that's turned into relational queries too. Um, but this explicit form of beta country allows us to uh, again read parameterize the model and now even beta country is gone from uh, from the penalty term so now it's gone both from the loss term and the penalty term and and now we can completely claim that we have eliminated uh, one of the functionally determined variables it's totally gone and so uh, the picture we had before uh, which was like you know, n to the n square, like 25 square, uh, has become something like 3 square. So now it's absolutely manageable, and you can easily see the effect of this when, when you actually implement this algorithm. Because uh, it's just really a few, like, uh, over of 10 many aggregation queries, right? And then you run this, like, 200 times. Each one of them is, again, aggregation queries on a database. 
And one thing that database knows how to do well is computing aggregates very well. Okay, uh, so that gives you kind of a hint of uh, um, uh, how to train machine learning model in the database without materializing the output uh, of the join query. And in some cases, you can, you can make things a lot faster. Uh, linear regression is not the only thing that we can do. Um, uh, so, you know, there are various classes, models, uh, that needs ideas from, uh, you know, not only those, those uh, ideas, but... For instance, if you want to train, um, let's see, uh, if you want to do k-means in a database, right, uh, then you might have to compute something called the uh, uh, geometric core set, but relationally. And it turns out that we can also apply, um, you know, um, uh, the uh, exploiting the structures of the relational data to compute the geometric core set using aggregation um, queries again, uh, efficiently. Um, now, even with the trick that I showed you, the functional dependency trick I showed you earlier, uh, formulas can get kind of interesting once you get beyond just like one single city to country functional dependency. Uh, and I had a lot of um, uh, fun programming this thing, so uh, uh, I used to code this up in C++ uh, with template programming that was horrible, uh, you know, every subscript that you type wrong, translate into the wrong code, and, and yeah, that, that's not fun, okay? Uh, but all I want to actually uh, to point out is that even though the formulas get more and more complicated depending on the structure of the queries and so on, uh, involving like matrix tensor product, Hachi raw product, uh, and, and so on, all of them are still relational aggregate queries, okay? So you, you kind of look at the semantic of what the formulas compute, uh, and they become relational aggregation queries uh, everywhere, okay? All right, so that is uh, kind of the, uh, uh, I'm done with the, the, the main message of, of my talk. I, hopefully I have uh, kind of convinced you that thinking about problems this way and, you know, trend models inside of a database, uh, push the optimization closer to the data is, is great, um, uh, can have great benefit. But I also want to mention, like maybe uh, take five minutes or, or so, to mention the other way, right, in which how the relational world can benefit from the statistical world. So I, and, uh, I just told you that relational uh, uh, aggregation is something a database knows how to do very well. Um, but it turns out that you can also learn uh, how to do aggregation well from knowing machine learning. So, you know, the thing actually uh, feeds on itself. Okay? Um, all right, so um, the idea is that uh, is, is the following. So you can think about aggregation query in a database um, as an inference problem. Okay? It is exactly an inference problem, in fact. Uh, and computing multiple aggregation uh, is the building block, as you have probably have seen before. Uh, so I'm going to to uh, basically give you kind of a, a hint, right? Remember, we had to compute these two things, like the sigma matrix and the column vector, and each entry of the sigma matrix uh, is uh, uh, a group by query. You know, you count something or you sum over something, okay? uh, stuff like this. Okay? Now, um, if you look at a, a, a very, very simple uh, uh, aggregation query, like, like this query over there, I don't have a good aggregation syntax like a data log form, so you know I hope this makes some sense. You just want to count the number of tuples uh, w x uh, y z you know uh, over this conjunction. Okay? I don't want to put a, a big SQL statement up there. Um, uh, anyhow, I hope you know what I mean. Um, now the re the relations R and S and T you can view them as actually indicator functions, okay? If a tuple is in R, then the function gives you a one. If a tuple is not in R, then the, the function gives you a zero, okay? And the count query becomes uh, computing a sum product form, okay? And sum product is exactly uh, an inference problem, right? Uh, if you ask Guy, he will tell you, 
all kinds of tricks to speed up some product computation. Okay? Uh, and that, you know, this is sort of like computing the partition function out of a gra graphical model. Uh, the, the difference in a database uh, context is that our models are typically very sparse. So you would not have like n square. Uh, um, you know, this function is, is almost zero everywhere except for the tuples which are in the database. Okay, so that's the difference. Uh, but otherwise, it really is the same thing. It's an aggregation problem. It's, a, it's a, an inference problem. And, uh, you know, computing aggregation with group by is basically marginalization. Uh, in um, uh, graphical models. Okay. So that's, that's it. Uh, so it, when you view things that way, uh, then um, uh, you will see that you can construct a query plan by constructing a tree decomposition of the input query. So if those of you who have some uh, idea of graphical models, you will see you know, the junction tree algorithm, uh, message passing, all of those things apply in the database context. Just have to do, apply them in the right way. In fact, you can do this with, with various semi rings and, and uh, do uh, maximization, minimization, uh, even uh, or Boolean queries. All of them apply in this, exactly the same framework. So there's actually a lot to learn from, you know, for, for relational query evaluation, uh, to learn from uh, uh, probabilistic graphical models and, and statistics. Uh, but there's a key difference, which is that. Um, yeah, the, the typical notion of complexity in the graphical model world does not apply in the database world uh, because we have a lot of sparsity in the database. Okay? So instead of tree width, which is actually the wrong notion for databases, we would have something more information theoretic and it could lead you to things like fractional hyper tree width or submodular width. And uh, these can be a lot smaller than tree width itself. So there are queries where in database where the tree width is very high, but it's actually trivial to compute because you know the functional dependencies are or degree information in a database, so it's a, it's a lot faster to do due to the sparsity and, and other information you have in the database. Uh, yeah, so this, this, you know, I can go on forever uh, about query evaluation in the database. Uh, I just wanted to, to mention to you, like, you know, one of the things that I told you earlier was a lie, uh, which was that, um, you know, the, the, the logic world was supposed to be deterministic and, you know, uh, there's no uncertainty going on, right? But that's not quite true, because the uncertainty comes from the data. Okay? Uh, so when you evaluate a query, what do, you, what do we want to measure? We want to come up with a query plan that will minimize the runtime, right? The runtime depends on the data, and the uncertainty is all from the data. So when we construct a new query plan, what we have to do is to basically, um, there are many ways, right? But you can sample from the data, you can run mini queries and to estimate the runtime, to estimate the output size of query. So all of those things become statistical estimation problems. So then you see that we, we build uh, a machine learning on top of a database. The database itself is built on top of a machine learning um, engine. And so the problem actually feeds on itself. So there's, there's actually a great synergy between these two worlds. Uh, and uh, I hope, you know, I, I have given you some uh, interest in digging deeper into both relational uh, database technology and also, uh, you know, if you are from the logic side, uh, learn more machine learning. Okay? Uh, if you're from the machine learning side, learn, learn some query optimization because it definitely is going to help. Uh, and that is all. Uh, I'm going to, uh, you know, just give a listen preference. Can take questions now, or if you're tired, then uh, we can chat uh, maybe you know tomorrow or something.